Hello everyone and welcome to the next instalment of our new series here on NHSN's YouTube channel exploring the identification of different wildflower groups you're likely to spot across the northeast. I'm James Commons, Senior Naturalist with NHSN and this time I thought we would look at something a little bigger and blousier, bindweeds. Now, many of you will be familiar with the great white flowers of bindweed from your local hedgerows, but for those who aren't, here's just a few fast facts about this really lovely group of plants. Forming the bulk of the family Convolvulaceae, that is really a mouthful, um, these are sprawling climbing plants often seen twisting their way through hedgerows and in scrub. Most of us know them for their big showy flowers, which are either white um, or less often pink. And I'm sure many gardeners out there are familiar with bindweeds um, and their daily struggle to remove them from their plots. This difficulty comes from the fact that bindweeds are notoriously deep rooted and it really is hard to shift them once they take hold. Now, in our area, excluding a few odd escapes from gardens, we have five species that you're likely to encounter in a range of different habitats. Three of these are rather common and two of them are quite scarce. We'll look at all five today. So first up, we have the common and quite familiar hedge bindweed, Calistegia sepium. Perhaps the species you're most likely to encounter whilst out and about, um, and importantly, a rather abundant plant in specific habitats. Now, this one prefers damp soils and is most often encountered sprawling across other vegetation in damp hedgerows, in ditches, um, wetland sites as well, but really it can crop up anywhere where a little bit of water is held in the soil. Quite typical of this group of plants, it has white flowers. Um, many of you will be seeing these on your travels at present. Certainly it's flowering here on my street here in Heaton. Um, but what is important to note with these is that they are a tad smaller in size than another species you will see shortly. Not enormously so, however, so to identify them it's necessary to look at a few other features. Otherwise, hedge bindweed has bright green arrow-shaped leaves and a very noticeable clambering habit. The flower stalk, the small stalk which connects the individual flower to the main stem, is also hairless. Um, you'll see why this is important again quite soon. The two important features to confidently identify hedge bindweed are shown here. Firstly, on the right, you can see the leaf sinus, simply the gap between the lobes of the leaf. In this species, you'll see that it's quite clearly V-shaped. Um, and this is a useful aid should you encounter a pink form of hedge bindweed, which can look an awful lot like a far scarcer plant we'll discuss soon. And finally, we have the real clincher. Here on the reverse of the flower, you'll note the green bracts are well spaced, leaving a gap in the middle. Through this, you can see quite a bit of the green sepals underneath. Among the large white flowering bindweeds, this is rather unique. So here we have the second very common bindweed in our area and the one you are perhaps most likely to confuse with hedge bindweed. This rather lovely and slightly imposing plant is large bindweed, Calistegia slovatica, a species formerly grown as a garden plant, which is now quite well established in many areas, particularly close to our towns and cities, where it often engulfs entire hedgerows or can be seen sprawling right up into the canopy of trees. As its name suggests, um, this is a rather large and impressive plant, and the flowers are indeed bigger than those of the former species, though not always noticeably so. To identify this one, you'll have to focus on two features in particular. And here we have them. Large flowers aside, with large bindweed, you'll first notice its rather large shiny leaves. These are often a tad more glossy than those of hedge bindweed, which if you remember were sort of bright radiant green. But again, this is rather subjective and isn't always the best help. Instead, you'll need to look at those bracts again. And you'll see here on the right, the bracts of large bindweed are overlapping. 
So much so that they completely hide, but almost so, those green sepals underneath that were so visible in hedge bindweed. We look at both together now. Yeah, and here we have just a helpful comparison between the two. Large bindweed on the left with its overlapping bracts and hedge bindweed on the right with its widely spaced ones and, of course, its visible sepals. That's all there is to it with these two, really. So if you've got a large white bindweed in your neck of the woods, check the bracts. And here we have just some iRecord maps for the two species we've discussed so far. As you can see, both are rather common, um, and I should say likely more abundant than these maps suggest, owing to the fact that these maps are just taken from iRecord. It's interesting to note, however, that large bindweed occurs mostly in urban areas towards the coast here, um, but perhaps not surprising given its status as a garden escape. And here we have a rather nice little bindweed, um, field bindweed, Convolvulus arvensis. The other two species aside, this is the one you're perhaps most likely to bump into when you're outing about across the northeast. Um, and it's particularly common as a weed of dry, often sandy soils like those on the coast or along farmland margins or perhaps even grassy roadsides. In fact, recently I also spotted this one growing as a pavement plant here in Heaton, so it does actually get into our times and cities from time to time, um, but less so than the other two. The first thing you'll notice with this one is that it's rather small flowered. Indeed, they are around less than half the size of the larger species. They are also pink um, and streaked with white to varying degrees and really, really variable. I read somewhere recently that there are now 10 distinct forms of field bindweed named because of the patterns on their, on their flowers. Another important feature with this one is habit. While it will scramble a bit, perhaps through some brambles or taller scrub, it nowhere reaches the height of the other two species and is most often seen as a prostate plant sprawling across the ground, perhaps in sand dunes or along the sides of tracks. And finally, the leaves are somewhat different. They are still arrow shaped, but they lack that really distinct V-shaped sinus between the leaf lobes that we looked at previously. And that's all there is to it, really, a small plant with pink flowers growing in a slightly different habitat to the other two. You've most likely got field bindweed. Now, this is where things get a little interesting and perhaps even a little confusing. This rather beautiful plant here is hairy bindweed, Calistegia pulchra a garden ornamental which has been known to escape and indeed naturalise on occasion. Seldom travelling far from where it was introduced, it can, however, form quite long-lived stands which persevere in the environment, usually close to towns and cities, but it does get itself around. I've seen this on the coast up towards Allenmouth, and at a few of the more typically wild places, it pays to look for it. Now, hairy bindweed shares the pink, white-streaked flowers of field bindweeds, the one we saw previously, but they are much, much larger often closer to large bindweed in size. It is also a far more burly plant, just about everything about it is bigger than field bindweed. And like the first two plants we looked at, it often grows upward through trees and scrub. Given that pink forms of other bindweeds are not unheard of, um, there are a couple of identification features you can use to really clinch your hairy bindweed. Um, we'll look at these just now. Now, apologies, the first of these two features isn't actually shown here in the picture as I just couldn't find a plant in time to take this photo. Perhaps that goes to show how rare it is within the environment. But if you remember, I mentioned the flower stalks of the other larger bindweeds were bald, hairless. In hairy bindweed, if you look at these flower stalks, you'll notice, or you should do, two lines of hairs running down their length. Presumably, it is from this where the plant gets its name. If you don't have a hand lens, however, a far more reliable feature are the leaves shown here to the right. If you look closely at these leaves, you'll note that they're almost 
parallel sided as opposed to the clearly arrow shaped V shaped leaves here of the large bind weed to the left. And even more importantly, if you look at the sinus here between the lobes, in hairy bindweed, this is actually square, whereas in large bindweed and hedge bindweed, it is quite clearly V shaped. This is a really nice difference between the two and can really help you identify your plant, even if it isn't in flower. But of course, we do like to see the flowers. And just another two maps here, again, for South Northumberland. You'll see straight away that both of these species are quite poorly recorded. In the case of field bindweed, this absolutely does not mean this is a rare plant, but with hairy bindweed, it's probably fairly accurate. I do wonder, though, if you can add a few more dots to the map whilst you're out and about. I like this one. Last but not least, we have what must surely be the highlight for bindweed enthusiasts in our region. This attractive plant is sea bindweed, Calistegia soldanella, and as its name suggests, it is restricted entirely to good quality habitat on the coast. And even here, it is pretty rare. It's included on, I think, both of our Northumberland rare plant registers, and nationally is a species of conservation concern. Now, this plant is always found close to the coast. You will not find it inland, and if you do, I might have to eat my hat over there in the corner. Um, typically, it is found within sand dune habitats, where it often sprawls between clumps of marum and other coastal plants, or on shingle beaches, but it can, at times, actually get into coastal grassland. Um, but this is unusual. I do know this is the case at Northumberland Wildlife Trust's wonderful East Chevington Reserve, where this species really grows in abundance among sort of in less than typical habitat, where, of course, it could also occur alongside field bindweed. Now, like field bindweed, this one has pink flowers um, streaked with white, but these are noticeably larger. Um, but to save any confusion whatsoever, you simply need to look at the leaves. And here they are. You'll see here that the leaves of sea bindweed are succulent, like so many coastal plants adapted to cope with relatively harsh conditions. They are far fleshier than any other species on this list and rather nicely are almost perfectly heart or kidney shaped, depending on your preference. And with that one, that's all there is to it. But if you do encounter this species on the coast, please, please, please do send in a sighting. Um, it is, as I said, a rare plant which is declining and it is really good to know where it is so it can be conserved. And with that, thank you for watching. Hopefully we kept this one a little more concise than the clovers video previously. We'll keep going with these little videos um, as long as you keep watching them. And I look forward to sharing another one with you very soon. Bye-bye.